ahead and unmute yourself just to open us in prayer. And then I'm going to pass the ball to Ernie Mecca uh, when you're done. Just have Ernie kind of give us a quick review point from last week. You bet. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to come together. Your, 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 your gift to us in Christ is everything, Lord. It's absolutely everything. And it's all we have. It's the only unshakable thing we have is our faith in you, Lord, through the grace and the truth of Jesus. So may we learn more deeply than ever about that today. May, uh, may we listen. And uh, Lord, when it's time to, for us to speak, may we pour out words that come from you. We just love you. We thank you for this time where we can grow in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Ron. So, Ernie, if you would unmute yourself. Uh, Ernie Meck is up in Wyoming, longtime FCA guy and a coach. And he's got just a story that is a good review point for last week. So, Ernie, would you share that before we start into Chapter 2 of the handbook? Yeah, thank you, Gordon. Uh, between what Ron's teaching last week and what Chris shared about <clears throat> the battle just raging continually on man's perfection versus God's level of perfection, I've been coaching for 30 years uh, on staff 17 with FCA and through all the coaches ministry training and I'm a coaches ministry guy, but I was a volunteer assistant basketball coach, varsity assistant last year. And, and so I was only in a volunteer basis and I got thrust into the last third of the season having to, had to take over the JV program. And at that time, the JV program was uh, undefeated. We were in the meat of our starting the meat of our schedule, and two of the fre starting freshmen got pulled up to varsity. Well, <clears throat> we lost our first four games, so all of a sudden, volunteer coach Mecca veteran takes over uh, from a rookie that's uh, ten and zero, and we go zero and four. And I got caught up in that perfection measurement of man's. And I didn't press my kids or do anything, but I came home and told my wife, I said, you know what, honey, I think I lost it. I don't think I have my mojo anymore. And she just held me accountable and was like, what are you basing that on? The fact that you lost four games? Hmm. And yes, that's where I was. I was all, I got caught up in the pride thing. I was like, okay, maybe I can't coach anymore. I'd been a varsity coach for years and had, you know, I had good success, but I got caught up. And when Chris shared that story about the battle never ends and just, it, it just, you got to always be sensitive to it. If anybody should have known better, you know, here I am trained up in sports ministry and coaches ministry specifically. And I fell victim. I, and I basically was going to quit at the end of the season. I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And she said, think about all the relationships already. And she said, I have seen fruit from your presence in the program. So I just, I visited with uh, Gordon later just to tell him that story that, man, I just lived through this. I just lived through this and I'll be 63 in June. <laughs> Thanks, Ernie. I'm going to get the chapter two up here on the screen. Ron, do you have a, just a connecting thought before we start into this chapter two? Yeah, I appreciate that, Ernie. Uh, man, who of us who have coached for a while have not have not been there but a really quick thing I told my players uh, 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 recently like we all understand that boiling water is at 212 degrees Fahrenheit and if you leave the water on the stove it remains boiling when you take the water off the stove and if you let it sit for a while it adapts to room temperature and um, that's a I think a real good picture of our world the two kingdoms the kingdom of God is on fire I mean it's got it's it's heated up we're supposed to be hot in Christ. When we get off of Christ, in other words, when Christ is no longer our focal point, we're going to start blending into the room temperature and we're going to cool off rather fast. It won't be long after this meeting today that we're on that we'll, we could easily get back in the room temperature and start thinking just like man's kingdom does again. So I think that's a great word, Ernie, a great reminder that we need to stay hot for Christ by staying on the burner, on, we're on tap with Christ all the time. And that's what, uh, obviously, we're going to be talking that through in this lesson as well. Okay, so, fellas, you're looking at, hopefully, on my share screen, Chapter 2, the beginning of perfection. 
Uh, again, we're studying through Wes Neal's handbook on athletic perfection. So I'm going to read a little bit and then we'll have a little bit of interaction here. But again, this is titled The Beginning of Perfection. This is really this, you could say, the salvation chapter. It says the perfect athletic performance is one you do God's way. But to do it God's way, you need God's power. You can never experience it on your own power. God's power is available only in Jesus Christ. Because of a remarkable act of God, you're able to experience the power in your athletic performance. Here you'll see how Jesus Christ can become your foundation for a perfect athletic performance. Just for a moment, let's focus on you. How would other people describe you? Would they say, great, terrific, nice, all right? Those words don't say a lot, do they? People who know you could go into detail concerning your likes and dislikes. He likes chocolate cake and football. She likes volleyball and football players. That might describe you a little better. People who know you more intimately could disclose things that might even surprise. But who are you? An anatomy student could describe you as a person with 206 bones, 639 muscles, and a complex 50,000 miles of blood vessels intertwining throughout your body. Your brain weighs approximately three pounds. Anatomy can tell interesting things about how you're made, but who are you really? Only the Bible explains who you are. You are the work of God. You're the masterpiece of all God's creation. And then Psalm 139 says, For thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I'll give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. And then it says, you didn't happen by chance. You were designed by the architect of the world. Do you know how absurd it would be to think you just happened with no design from the creator? Now, Coach Brown, I'm going to toss it back to you because uh, I've got God in the red over on the right-hand side because one of the things that uh, Dave Gibson wrote, the more than winning uh, gospel track with FCM almost 30 years ago, and if you if you look at that, I always love the outline he put together, which if you're going to share a testimony of the gospel, uh, you've got to know something about God, something about man, something about Christ, and then how to respond to that message. Just a simple outline, but I've always kind of used that. I'm a simple uh, defensive lineman from days gone by, and uh, but I'd like you just to stop here and just comment a little bit on this, Ron. Yeah, and, I, and I've <clears throat> talked to Greg Gilbert, uh, a pastor that we all know from Louisville over the years, and I love that uh, God-man-Christ response uh, mode. But when we talk about God here in Psalm 139, Gordon, we, we, we could tend to make that about us. But God did something in us for him. And that's why it becomes ridiculous for us coaches. And Ernie just talked about his wife rebuking him for making it about him in comparison to other men based on a win-loss record. Um, the inward parts, what God has given us for our particular skills, talents, whatever it is, what we would call the denominator of life, all the potential that we have, it's for him. We keep getting mad at God or we keep comparing ourselves because we want what that guy has or we don't have this. And we make it about nickels and noses and sizes of things in comparison. It's ridiculous. It's about God. Whatever you have, you've been given from God. And so that I think even in this statement in Psalm 139 and that portion of scripture, this isn't really about me. This is really about God and what he wants to do eventually through me. But it starts with God. It's good, Ron. And then you can see it continues here. Uh, let's say if you have a watch, many delicate mechanisms, if you took the watch completely apart, put the pieces in a paper sack, shook the sack, threw the pieces into the air, what chance do you think the watch would have to come back together again all by itself? It's about the same chance you have to, to come together without the design and the workmanship of God himself. You're completely unique. I have a dignity only God can give you. And then this is, again, this is the part where we understand a little bit about ourselves, which 
when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou dost take thought of him? And the son of man, thou dost care for him, yet thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and dost crown him with glory and majesty. And then we get into your purpose. Unique as you are, it's impossible to understand your purpose for living without Jesus Christ. Your purpose is to have continuing fellowship with God by bringing glory to him, but there's no way this can happen experience on your own merit. The Bible explains it this way, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then it says the word sin, it's an archery term. It means missing the mark. The sin mark is that distance between the bullseye and the target and the actual place the arrow hits. And then right under that, that uh, illustration, it says when the Bible tells us that we've sinned, it's describing our missing the mark of God's perfection. We fall short of his glory. Now, uh, Doug Pollack, DP, who's with FCA in Illinois, like it on mute yourself, uh, DP and I were talking about this illustration, which I think is a good illustration, but Greg Gilbert, who Ron just mentioned, gives us a little more complete, uh, perhaps, idea of this illustration. Again, keep in mind, all illustrations fall short of, of God's word. They just help us understand it better. So, DP, if, if you're on there, would you just share your thoughts about this? Yeah, um, when I was heard Greg Gilbert's uh, um, definition a couple of weeks ago on the Christian Worldview show uh, hosted by David Wheaton, he said that um, sin was not just shooting the arrow and missing the mark, but it was actually shooting that arrow directly at the heart of God. In other words, rebellion against God. And I think a lot of times... Um, uh, myself right at the top of the list, I do not take my personal sin near as uh, serious as I should because uh, we sort of rationalize and say, yeah, everybody's a sinner. So it's like we sort of just toss our personal sin into the big ocean with everybody else and, and it can look very insignificant. But, but um, that's, not, that's not really what it is. I mean, he sees it as detestable and uh, unacceptable. Um, to him and and the more we can see our personal sin for for what it is um then we're going to see ourselves as lowly and god's going to be even uh bigger so i think that's a good um uh description really of, of sin gordon that he gave where we're actually in rebellion against god mm -hmm. shooting an arrow directly at his heart not just missing the target it's good, DP. Appreciate that. I want to drop down a little bit towards the bottom of page seven and just that paragraph that starts with one of the most amazing runs in Rose Bowl history illustrates our break in fellowship with God. The 1929 Rose Bowl game was determined the number one team in the country, undefeated and untied. Georgia Tech was facing an undefeated, once tied University of California. Disaster struck in the second quarter of a scoreless game. That's a pretty good name here. Stumpy Thompson carrying the ball for Georgia Tech fumbled when hit on his own 36 yard line. Roy Regals of California grabbed the ball in midair, raced towards the goal line. However, just as he's about to be swarmed under by a host of Georgia Tech players, Regals planned his right foot reverse direction. He ran towards his own goal line with shouting players from the other team. Let me just pull this up a little bit so I can see it better here. Uh, he, so he planted his foot, reverse direction, ran towards his own goal line with shouting California players trying desperately to stop him. One of his teammates finally caught up to him on his own 12-yard line. Momentum was too great. He finally got turned around only to have a pack of grateful tech players bury him on the one-yard line. The bewildered Roy Regals was consoled by, but amazed by his sympathetic teammates. California elected to punt on first down and attempt to get out of the bizarre situation. It was ironic that Regals, now playing center, snapped the ball to the player who had tried to turn him turn, turn around. His kick was blocked, and Tech was given a two-point safety. These two points proved to be the margin of victory for Georgia Tech, eight to seven. So, Coach Brown, I'm going to toss it back to you. Uh, you've used this illustration before, and uh, what I like about it is just the sense of direction that uh, Regal had lost. So Ron, 
Would you comment? And then I'm going to put up on the share screen a picture of actually Roy Regals as Ron shares just for a moment. Yeah, Gordon, that's always been a great story. It's a fascinating story, but um, um, you know, really that story, uh, it's funny how his nickname, it, that story gave him the nickname Wrong Way Regals. Um, can you imagine having a nickname like that the rest of your life, Wrong Way Regals? And his guy was a really good player too. He was an All-American player. But the point is, is that um, we're all wrong way. Wrong way Brown. Wrong way Pollock. Wrong way Softly. I mean, just insert your name. We're all wrong way. We came out of the womb running the wrong way. And that's the hard thing for people to understand. We kind of think we're going the right way. In fact, Regals, when he was, when he was interviewed after the game, was supposedly uh, say, saying, well, I thought I was running the right way. <laughs> and that is so true. I mean, we just kind of, again, if we're off of the stove of Christ and onto the lukewarmness of this world and room temperature, we're going to think that wrong is right and right is wrong. And so when Jesus intercepts your life, I think on the, on the positive side of that, now you get the chance to go in the right direction. If somebody could have dragged Regals down, pointed him in the right direction, or turned him around somewhere to get him going in the right direction, boy, that would have been helpful. But he wasn't, he wasn't paying attention to what people were saying. He was just running in the direction that he thought he was to go. And that's so often the case with me and, and a lot of us. And that's why, you know, as, as DP just talked about breaking God's heart, Psalm 51 David's, you know, repentance piece there, it's about not a broken law. Yeah, there was a broken law for sure, but it's about breaking God's heart. And um, that's why this picture, I think, is a really good picture, Gordon, because it, the, we've got to get that turned around, and that only comes through uh, Christ and him getting us on the proper road in the proper direction. Thanks, Ron. And I want to skip to the next page because I'm trying to make sure we get this, uh, this chapter covered. I know a lot of you are probably believers and some of this is you're kind of going, Hey, I, I understand this. I've used it a lot. Um, I think it's good to cover this even in so much as one of the things I found helpful as a coach for many years was simply going and walking through this with my, my team. And so I would just take them through each of these pages, walk through it, stop, talk a little bit. But as you see that next page, you see a jumper with rockets attached to his back falls short. This is true of our personal lives. It doesn't matter how we compare to other people on our own merit. We fall short of God's perfection. It cannot be in fellowship with him, but God did something about our situation. And of course, the famous John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And this is God has taken action. For us to have perfect fellowship with God, two things have to be done. We cannot do these two things for ourselves. First, we have to be shown who God is. It's impossible to fellowship with someone you don't even know. In Jesus Christ, God made himself known to us. In John 1.18, no man has seen God at any time. Only the begotten Son, who is the bosom of the Father, he has expla explained him. So you see, I've got my little note there of Christ, that the second thing God establishes through Jesus Christ was impossible for fellowship. So Christ is the key there. So um, Coach Brown, let me run, let me just throw it back to you for just a minute. And yep. you could just sum up maybe this next section so we can kind of keep moving a little bit. It's great, though. We've got Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. But clearly here is what you share with your athletes probably every week, that this is all about Christ. Yeah, and you can see from the diagram, Gordon, uh, you got all these men attempting to reach the other side to God's perfection and they can't do it. Well, that's a good example of religion. I mean, you know, whether it's uh, a religion that's kind of considered Christian and it's really not, or some far off religion that we would call a far off religion. It's all man's attempt to reach God. And the only one that can connect us to God the Father, as it says in John 14, six, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He didn't say I am a way, a truth, a life. He said the way, meaning the only way. 
And this is where a lot of people want to get off board. But you have to really examine what you're believing. That's why doctrine is so important. If Christ is not the only answer for eternal life, then it's a false attempt to reach God and you will fall short, no question. Just picking up there, um, we've got 2 Corinthians 5.21 at the top of the page. He, God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, take our place in the cross so we might become the righteous of God in him. And so God sees the perfection of Jesus Christ in us. And then number four, <clears throat> this, is, this penalty is payment, is our free gift from God. And then it moves into that greatest decision that God has provided a way to have fellowship with him. But we must make the decision to take his way. We must personally accept a gift where it is ours. The same is true of God's gift. We must personally accept it to make it our own. Jesus paid our penalty <clears throat> on the cross by representing us to his father. The payment is ours when we accept it. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Again, that really key verse, John 3:16. You can see there's the illustration of the guy toting the wheelbarrow over the waterfalls falls, and then it's like, hey, do you want to do you want to go for this ride? So, Ron, could you just summarize that rather than me read it as I put that picture up of that tightrope walk, walker, somebody going across the falls? Yes. Well, we've seen God. We we know that of His existence. It all started with Him. We got to man. God created man. We saw the sin um, that. Uh, created a, a obviously a major gap between us and a holy perfect God um, and then Christ the answer that Jesus Christ regardless of our decision Jesus Christ made his decision God the Father punished chose to punish his son for our sake so that we could have eternal life and not bear the burden of the penalty of sin and so Jesus Christ has done his part. He's laid it out for us on the cross. And the question is, uh, beyond just an intellectual belief that, yes, this happened, Jesus did come some 2,000 years ago and did this thing. Yeah, he, he did rise from the dead. But it's absolutely laying yourself into that wheelbarrow that that one is carrying across the, uh, the tightrope there. It is absolutely you pouring your sin out at the cross, just handing your sin off to the Lord, recognizing that you're guilty and receiving as a response, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is your game changing response. That comes from God himself to even give you the faith to do that. And when you choose to make that decision, you now have eternal life and it's not done by you. You're just riding in the wheelbarrow. It's, it's done by what Jesus did for you on the cross. Thanks, Ron. And so if you go, you can see I've got the bottom of page nine, uh, the response. And so you, you can kind of see here on page 10, we've got a lot of really good stuff about what, what kind of belief is this. You can see I have highlighted down below there in the yellow uh, what happens when Jesus controls your life can be explained this way. You have basketball abilities that are inferior to those of another player. You'll never be able to duplicate his talent. You can copy his training program, follow his diet, wear his uniform, but you'll never become him. But let's say that through an operation, it was possible for you to enter his body. You would experience the fullness of his abilities. You'd be playing, ba you'd be playing basketball through you. So in the Christian experience, you can never copy the attitudes, thoughts, and actions of Jesus. When you believe in him, accept him, he lives his life through you. It is your belief in Jesus Christ that makes you a Christian. And then Wes gives kind of the well-known kind of sinner's prayer here, and you can read that for yourself. But he says the words of this prayer, that did, the words didn't make you a Christian. It's your belief in Jesus Christ that did. Your relationship with God established by your belief in Jesus Christ cannot be broken. You'll always be in God's family throughout eternity. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they will follow me. I will give eternal life to them and you shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. And then this is the kind of the closing paragraph. And then we're going to open it up for some, a, a video here in a minute and some application. But let me just sum it up this way. 
Since becoming a Christian, I discovered that nobody can be a successful carbon copy of Jesus Christ. Imperfection can never copy perfection and get perfect results. The perfect athletic performance is Jesus Christ living and performing through you. If you believe in him, totally rely upon him, you have taken the first step in experiencing the perfect athletic performance. Next, we will view the role of the Holy Spirit in your perfect athletic performance. So with that, what, what I want to do is turn to Chris softly. So Chris, if you want to unmute, one of the, the challenges, you're an athletic director at a Christian school. You're also the head football coach. And so one of the things I think is a challenge is this is really good material. <clears throat> Obviously, the gospel, make sure your players, your coaches understand this. But there seem to be challenges as you work through perfection when you're dealing with believers and non-believers on your team. Could you share a little bit how you've kind of navigated this role at your school? Sure. The first statement to me is that whether you're at a Christian school or a public school, obviously with wisdom to your authority and to your leadership uh, about what freedoms they're going to give you to, to speak about Christ and how you can run your program, for me, I would argue that I would not coach or bring material differently to the non-believers, to the believer. And here's my argument why, is to the believer, it's that process of salvation, of becoming more and more saved, of getting deeper and deeper into Christ. And so as Paul talks about, we preach the gospel in season and out of season. And to the non-believer, that's the truth. That's what they need is they need the gospel before they can ever do sports God's way. They need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it's the same thing over and over again is it's just the gospel. And so that doesn't change whether it's believer or non-believer. It's consistency with the truth. But the second thing I would say, especially to us as coaches who, who on a day-to-day -day basis deal with the reality of, man, it's not always like summer camp, you know, not after every practice is there a, is there a praise Jesus moment and kids rejoicing and, and everyone is growing in Christ after every practice? That's not the way it is. And I'm reminded of a story uh, Pastor Tim Keller states, and he talks about having a bunch of applicants into his program and how they all talked, all these, all these mature men in Christ talked about how they never heard the gospel growing up. Didn't hear the gospel growing up until very recently, or we, we liked your church because you preach the gospel every week, but I didn't have that growing up. And over time, at first he thought, man, I'm doing a really good job. You know, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel, just like we would be as coaches. He said, but over time, I got to thinking, I know some of the pastors these guys grew up with, or I know the church, or I know the area. And he goes, I know they had the gospel preached to them, but their hearts were hardened. Their ears were shut off. And I think that's really important for us as coaches to know is, is our job is to be faithful. It's to scatter the seed. And if they don't hear it, if they leave my program and go to yours at college and, and for whatever reason they say, man, this is the first time I've ever heard the gospel, there's no shame in going, man, I was unfaithful with my part. As a matter of fact, it's probably I was faithful, but the Lord had a more sovereign plan than my plan. And, and it's, there was a song a couple of years ago about what if I'm 13, I think is the song. And, and it's talking about the different people that have brought the gospel to this person's life. And finally, <laughs> at person 13, it made sense. The Lord softened the heart. And it was, it was a transformative experience. And so my two application points are, one is consistency with the believer and the non-believer. Now, I'm going to have deeper conversations with the believers, but those are typically going to happen behind closed doors when they come see me and ask deeper questions. But two is, is with that consistency is not harboring any resentment or, or even worry if ultimately I've given the gospel, I can give it up to God and just say, you know, what you do with it is up to you. My job is to be a faithful sower of the word. And, and that's what I need to do just disguised as a football coach. Good. Thanks, Chris. Now, Ron, I'm going to toss it back to you and I'm going to have you introduce the video um, that we're going to kind of close out with. Uh, we'll have some discussion after it, but you want to okay. just set this up something Tony weighs and, and Robbie yeah. Trent did, and I know they're on the call as well. Yeah, let me just comment on what Chris said first. I love that, man. There's just not, there's just not enough guys saying that. I love the one message piece, Chris, because there are so many of us who are trying to 
academicize the the gospel and make it softer and and make it more user friendly uh, for this group versus that group. Man, kudos to you. No wonder God has chosen you because we need bold servants like that. That's number one. Number two, trusting God with the uh, sovereignty, with the results as to the decisions the kids make. So thank you for that. Yeah, you know, uh, Gordon, this next piece, um, we kind of call it the grace piece. But I want to make be real clear. We, we found a way, before you show it, Gordon, let me just say this. I, I don't believe... This is not a recycling job thing. This is not some like technique we've discovered and, you know, God showed us this. This was an overflow some years ago when I was out there doing a bunch, bunch of things with FCA, doing sports God's way. It was an overflow that, kinda, that God kind of gave me at the moment to, re- to show the representation of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We don't work for it. And so uh, then... Um, you know, we kind of started doing it a little bit in FCA, but I think it's really important just to allow coaches to use whatever means God does when you're out there in the middle of coaching kids that the Holy Spirit brings to your attention some ways to demonstrate the truth and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the payment that Christ paid for us on the cross. Don't don't make this some type of, a, you know, a legalistic, oh, this has got to be done at every thing because then it you've lost its salt at that point so anyhow i'm going to turn it uh turn that over to uh, robbie trent who's on our who's on our call right now robbie you were there last year when you did this at leadership camp at the uh, fca leadership camp here in in the state could you uh could you explain kind of what's going on here you were on a bullhorn uh and i know tony's got the um uh the commentary on it uh in the video yeah, coach, appreciate it. And I mean, I stole this from you. So I <laughs> appreciate you putting me through this and getting me to puke on a gym floor all those years ago. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I would get doing sports guys away without being uh, put through the paces. So man, I appreciate that. And man, I would I'd reiterate what you just said. There's no perfect doing sports guys way drill. Because in essence, the gospel applies to all drills. Therefore, I think for each one of us, we have a responsibility to seek the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit man, how can I bring the gospel to bear for my athletes within the drills that we're doing? It's not just a unique situation at an FCA camp one time a summer, but can be all the time in your gym, in your weight room, in your practice environment. And so I, I, would, I would echo that completely. And I think DP maybe alluded to this, but Psalm 51, verse 4, after Bathsheba, David's saying, against you and you only have I sinned. And I think on our own, we can see our sin against others, but only by the Holy Spirit's power can we see that our sin is ultimately against God and bring that conviction of sin and, and cause us to repent and believe. And yes, like Safi said, that's for salvation, but it's also growing as a Christian. It's the same message. And so this is an opportunity to really position your athletes in a position where they can be impacted by the Holy Spirit, drawn to repentance and belief real time, right in the middle of training and competition so that that could then to transfer to life. So in essence, at this camp, we'd already put them through a ton of workouts and it was sports specific. It was, it was getting them in their environment. And, you know, there was football drills going on in here, basketball drills going on over there, volleyball drills going on over there, but then bringing them together and allowing the whole camp to see the gospel very clearly. And, and so I think Tony ways did a phenomenal job of capturing the moment and then putting this video together. So were there, were there athletes born again right in the middle of this drill? I don't know. But I know that there was a lot of athletes that were impacted. And not this drill, but other camps that uh, Coach Brown and I have done. I think Safi was there. Gordon was there. It was at a FCA camp in, in Kearney, Nebraska one time. During a similar drill like this, there was an athlete born again right in the middle of this. And so you don't have to be in the altar call setting and praying the prayer up there in the auditorium. It's, this could happen real time on the field. So yeah, enjoy the video, and yeah, I hope it's a blessing. ...of the gospel message was put on display. Husker great and former NFL running back Roy Halu Jr. was with us for the camp. We had all of the kids on the football field together doing a number of different drills, and it culminated with one particular challenge. FCA leader Robbie Trent asked for volunteers to come and stand just outside the goal line and serve a volleyball with the intent of hitting one of the goalpost uprights. Should they fail, the whole group had to sprint the width of the field and back and do 10 push-ups. 
It was July and it was hot. The first volunteer stepped up, served, and missed. Robbie told the kids to line up, and then he shouted, ready, set, go. Across the field and back they sprinted, then dropped to the turf to do 10 push-ups. The next volunteer stepped up, they also missed, and the cycle repeated. In fact, that cycle repeated for five volunteers. They were wiped out. The six kids stepped up, served, and it wasn't close. The groan was audible because they all knew what was next, or so they thought. Robbie had the kids line up and then shouted, ready, set, brace. The kids looked confused. And then all at once, Roy began running and running and running. He ran from one sideline to the other, 21 trips in total, and interspersed in that run, he did 120 push-ups. As a side note, his hip is in bad enough shape that he was less than 90 days away from having replacement surgery at the time. During Roy's run, the place was absolutely silent. The point was obvious. Roy did nothing that obligated him to run all those laps and do all those push-ups. The kids earned the consequence, but he took it on in their place. What a great picture of God's grace and mercy through the cross. Hearing the gospel is critical. And let me tell you, for those present, seeing the gospel modeled through example had a huge impact. Much more like this to come. If you're already connected to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, we appreciate you. If you're not, Good stuff, Ron. Let me kick it back to you. Uh, I've got a, probably five minutes before we'll kind of close out and we'll let guys stay on and chat and ask questions after, after we kind of close the session. But that's some well, good stuff there. Yeah, and, and, you know, I appreciate guys like Chris Offley and Robbie Trent. Uh, those guys were interns uh, when I was uh, heading up FCA here in Nebraska. Um, those guys came on as interns and they became coaches and, you know, they've never let this go. Uh, the doing sports God's way and being doers of the word is something that's been bloodstream. And that's the, the, another word for that is discipleship. That's really what discipleship looks like. If all you are is a learner, if all you do is sit in a building um, like a Bible study or a church or a seminary and you're just grasping all the hermeneutics and all the eschatology and all the great doctrine that's out there and you haven't learned how to apply it in the world that God has called you to live in, like the world of sports, we have become useless, the book of James says. That's just useless. So I appreciate guys like these because and, and others around the country uh, that are that are living this out. But if we're not doers of the word, Gordon, if we're not demonstrating and using opportunities to parabolize sports like that grace piece and and challenging people to have their focus and their minds on Christ consciously while they are doing their sport, then we've missed a good game. And so that's what I really enjoy about Wes's book and hopefully we can really become doers of the perfection of Jesus Christ. We're not perfect, but we're declared perfect because of Christ. And now the righteousness and the perfection of Christ gets to live through us, bloodstream out of us as we focus our attention on him through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, even while we're coaching and playing sports. I see Ken Lewis is on with us this morning. Um, Ken, if you're still on, if you're able to unmute yourself, I know uh, you've been doing FCA for a whole lot of years up in uh, Idaho, neck of the woods, and I think you've implemented some of the doing sports God's way. And if you don't mind just maybe just weighing in for just a second, it'd be great to, to see and hear from you. Yeah, we, um, we've done the doing sports God's way with uh, quite a few of our coaches huddles and uh, we've done it one-on-one uh, -on -one with different college athletes and I know it's been really uh, liberating in a lot of ways you know especially when you you look at the what is the goal to be conformed to God's image and uh, you know I think a lot of people athletes and coaches when they look at that goal there they think well there should be more you know there and uh, I, I know that's been challenging I know it's, sometimes it's challenging to 
I, I think I've seen it more challenging to coaches at Christian schools sometimes. I don't know. That's just my experience because, um, you know, they're, they're looking at winning and uh, all the other things. And, uh, but I don't know, we've really enjoyed uh, going through that and um, we'd like to do more. We've done it with our, our coaches huddles, like uh, Gordon said there, we've, we've given those booklets out and use that for our coaches ministry time at SCA camp and uh, use the videos um, that Ron and Gordon have put together. And man, it's just been, um, just been a lot of fun to see what a guy would do uh, with those coaches and just see uh, their perspective change. So. Thanks, Ken. It's uh, always good to see you and know your, the Lord's using you in a big way. Got another guy on here, Brian Mitchell. Brian, if you figure out how to unmute yourself, I'd love to see and hear your voice. I know there's a number of years we went down to Branson and did some of this stuff. So I'd love to have you see your face and your voice and have you weigh in here a little bit if you could do that, Brian. Yeah, good morning. Uh, it's great to join you guys. Uh, having the blessing to work with Robbie Trent and Gordon and Coach Brown down here in uh, God's country in Branson, Missouri. We uh, did leadership camp uh, from Nebraska and Missouri for I think the better part of six years. And uh, the big part of our camp was implementing what we talked about today, uh, seeing these young athletes uh, run, run these grass fields um, on Table Rock Lake and, and, and really seeing a transformational process happen with our athletes and our coaches down here in South Central Missouri, FCA, where I serve as the area director. And so a, a, a powerful way, a, a powerful a way to do ministry with our coaches. We were in a coach's Bible study this morning. Um, I do eight of these a week down here on Zoom. And, <laughs> and we were in the book of First Samuel doing the second part of the second chapter. And and it was really neat to have some of this discussion come up about accountability and integrity, but that also flows back to uh, what we're talking about today is, is really not watering down the gospel, finding ways to show the gospel in a real way um, through our practices and through our games and, and really the character of our coach. And so a uh, blessing to be with you guys today, but also just encouraged by us kind of privately chatting to Robbie there that, man, this brings up a ton of memories <laughs> uh, of camp that we did down here. A, a, a lot of fun, but some, some great stuff, a lot of great substance here. Thanks, Brian. Ron, um, we've got just two minutes here before we'll call it good. Again, we'll, we'll let guys stay on the line for a little bit, ask questions and interact. But again, I wanted to make sure we had a good close here. Uh, before we do that. So, Ron, do you have just some final wrap-up thoughts? Of course, next week we'll be back on continuing into Chapter 3 of the Handbook. And uh, I believe Wes Neal will be joining us either next week or the week after, so that would be fun to have Wes on. So, Ron, give us some wrap-up thoughts and maybe just close us in prayer. And then again, Yeah, I just keep – I keep – Gordon, I keep thinking of the word integrity. And uh, – you know, it's the integration of our being and doing. In other words, we have a new nature in Christ. When we uh, had that response for what Christ did for us on the cross and we were born again, there's got to be an overflowing of the doing. And that's what's been missing in the sports world. Most of sports ministry, um, most everything in Christianity seems to be about um, us uh, wh where we stand and our relationship with God, but we don't, we don't ever hear so much about the doing and it's particularly in the world of sports. And so that's why uh, these pieces are huge. The way we entered the kingdom of God through Christ is the way we have to live in the sports world. So it's every single day. It's living out the gospel every single day and every single drill. And so the, our mindset has got to be on that. Uh, we cannot separate the being from the doing. The two shall become one, un indivisible at that point. That's what integrity is. When we're out there doing sports uh, man's way, even though we're Christians, we're kind of doing some silly little games that don't teach uh, the integration between the two. We're being very unfaithful. That is, that is a false god. We're promoting idolatry, but we never take it that way. We all think, well, we're going to get together and we're going to have a little prayer afterwards and a prayer before. But during the, the athletic contest, we haven't learned how to take the Bible study to the field. So that's what I love about the book. 
And that's a, that's a huge challenge for us. And this, this is big to God. God is really, really serious about us living out our faith as an overflow of who we are in Christ. It's good, Ron. Do you want to pray for us? And then I'll open up. I'll let, every, I'll let, let it open up to everybody. Yes, sir. Lord, I, I am guilty of the very thing I just shared. Uh, and I, I think every man on here probably is, every coach, Lord, to some degree, um, we get caught up in the kingdom, the kingdom of man scoreboards. We like nickels and noses. We like numbers. We like notoriety. We like publicity. We, 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 we don't, haven't really taught discipleship, Lord, with our youngsters. It's really hard for us to understand this material because it, we've been trained in such the wrong way for so long. We've been taught to compartmentalize our faith. Father, I just say it's time to repent. We repent from that, Lord. We, we, we want you to intercept our life. Wrong way regals, even after we've become a Christian, we've, we've become wrong way regals in how we conduct our faith. So Lord, with our new nature in Christ, may we uh, just overflow into doing our work heartily as unto you and not unto men. I pray that for every coach and every ministry guy on this uh, call today.